do. They are off. And this first minute or two is really key, Rick. Yeah, Dude, sure. I haven't seen that many weenies since the Sausage Fest I used to attend in college. Welcome to Flynn Dog Woodwork. So those guys really ate a heck of a lot of hot dogs. But today we're going to take a look at eight woodworking hacks that you may or may not know about. There's some really unique ones in here, so let's go take a look at them. So back in college, I used to hang out with a bunch of jerks. We would scribe out a large circle, and among other things, we would talk about what we wanted to do once we graduated college. The problem is we would always scribe out a large circle and it would be in the shape of an oval. And that's what this first tool is all about, making the perfect circle for all your jerks. So this first hack is all about making large circles on your workpiece. I really wish I knew about this hack when I made this clock right here. I scribed out this clock by taking a string and taking a nail and scribing out a perfect circle. However, I couldn't get it to be exactly perfect. And that's what this next hack is all about. So one of the issues that I always run into is I always tend to purchase a jig or a solution for a project after that project is done. Now I purchased this Rockler circle cutting jig right after I completed that clock. And as you can see, it's still in the packaging, but there's a much easier solution. Let's start to take a look at it. So for this little jig, you don't need a whole lot of material. You simply need a yardstick, a push pin, a pencil, a drill, and a drill bit. Now believe it or not, these simple little items will allow you to create a jig where you can draw a circle with a one inch diameter all the way up to almost six foot in diameter. Let's take a look at how we make this jig. So the first thing that we want to do is to find a drill bit that's wide enough where you can fit the tip of your pencil all the way down into the hole. Once we've found that bit, we're going to take our drill and we're going to drill holes at every half inch on that yardstick. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So here's a closer look at what we're going for. We have a drill hole at every half inch going down the entire length of the yardstick. The reason that I want to drill a hole at every half inch is because that's only the radius of the circle. So if you want to be able to draw a circle at every inch increment for the entire diameter, you need a hole at every half inch. So let's take a closer look at how this works. You simply take your push pin and you stick it into your first hole. Once you have that firmly in place, you can then take your pencil and stick it into any one of these holes and create the radius that you're looking for. And you can see it's very simple to do and you have that perfect radius. So this is a jig that really couldn't be easier to make. This thing can be as accurate as you want depending on how you lay out your holes. So for me, I could have really used this when I was making that clock. It could have made that three inch diameter with no problem whatsoever. So now that we've taken a look at our first jig, let's take a look at our second jig. This next jig is all about table saw and router setup. So this next jig is just as simple as the first jig. All you need is a piece of scrap 4x4 as well as some setup blocks. So let's get started on making this jig. So the first thing that I want to do is to get this 4x4 in the shape of a block. So we're going to take it over to the miter saw and chop it down and get two perfectly perpendicular edges to the side of this 4x4. So now that we have this block, we're going to take it over to the table saw and put some rabbits into it. So let's do that right now. So before we put these rabbits in, I want to talk about the size of rabbits that we're going to put into this 4x4. Now I'm going to put the most common size rabbits into this 4x4, starting with 1 8 of an inch. Then I'm going to go to a quarter inch, half inch, three quarters of an inch, and then one inch. By putting these rabbits into this piece of wood, you then have a quick reference guide to be able to adjust your table saw to the desired height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sharpie and I'm going to label each side of this wood so that I can tell the depth of each rabbit that I'm going to be cutting into it. So next I'm going to start by taking my one inch setup block and lower the blade until the top of the blade is just touching the top of the setup block. Once I've done that, I can start to cut my rabbits. So now I'll take my one eighth inch side and I'll create the corresponding rabbit. So hopefully you can see this, but I now have a 1 8 inch rabbit on this side. Now let's move over to the quarter of an inch rabbit. So in the same fashion, I'll take my quarter inch setup block and I'll raise my blade to 1 quarter of an inch. Once I feel comfortable with the height of the blade, I then can create the rabbit. Now you can see I have an 8 inch rabbit on this side as well as a quarter inch rabbit on this side. Now let's move on to the half inch rabbit. In the same fashion, I'll take my half inch setup block and raise the blade until it reaches a half inch. 
Once again, I'll take my side with a half inch label and I'll cut the rabbit. Next up, we'll raise it to three quarters of an inch. And after cutting the three quarter of an inch rabbit, it's time to do our final rabbit at one inch. For the one inch rabbit, I'm gonna flip the board over, find the corresponding one inch side and cut the rabbit. Lastly, I'm just gonna take a chisel and clean up any blade marks on those rabbits. So many of the labels I initially created were cut off. So I sanded it down and I made some easy to read labels so that I can tell which side has which depth. Here we have three quarters of an inch. Here we have a half an inch. Here we have a quarter inch. And here we have an eighth inch with a one inch on the top. So now we have a quick reference guide to easily adjust your table saw or your router table to five measurements that are commonly used in woodworking. And now we're right at one half of an inch. So with this little jig made, now we don't have to always reach for those setup blocks, which may be on the opposite side of your shop. You simply grab this block and you're ready to go. Well, I'm really digging these first two simple to make jigs that we've made so far. Before we move on to our third one, I ask you to do me a favor and hit that subscribe button below, as it really does help out this small woodworking channel. Also, for any of the tools that we take a look at today or are used in this video, I'll leave links in the description below so you can go check them out for yourself. Now let's move on to our third jig. So are you like me and you don't like switching out your regular table saw blade to a dado stack to make a quick dado? Well, this next jig allows you to make a quick dado with a normal kerf saw blade. So this next jig is a complete scrap wood jig. All you're gonna need is a little bit of scrap two by four. Let's go over to the miter saw and take a look at how we're gonna make this jig. So first off, I'm gonna take this piece of scrap two by four and I'm gonna cut it down to two pieces that are approximately 12 inches wide. So now that we have two pieces of two x four that are cut to approximately 12 inches long, let's talk a little bit about plywood. So one thing that boggled my mind when I first started woodworking is that plywood is not the dimensions that it says. If you go to buy a piece of three quarter inch plywood, it is not exactly three quarters of an inch thick. Let me show you. So this is a three quarter inch piece of plywood and this is a three quarter inch setup block. If I place this setup block on top of the plywood, you can see that this setup block overhangs the plywood by approximately a 64th of an inch. Now there are a couple solutions you can use to account for this undersized plywood. Specifically, you can use things like these undersized plywood bits that are made specifically to create dados and plywood. However, there's a better solution. And that solution is to use the actual plywood as a reference. Now here you can see I've taken those two pieces of two by fours and I've set them against the plywood. I'm gonna make sure that the side at the very end is completely flush with that plywood. Once I feel comfortable with that, I'm then gonna clamp it down. Once I have these two two by fours clamped down, I now know that the difference between these two pieces of wood is the exact width of that plywood. I'm now then gonna go over to the miter saw and cut off the other end so that both pieces of wood are completely flush. Now that we have this jig completely flush on one side, we can push that flush edge all the way to the table saw fence. Then we can use the other side as a reference to cut out our dado. So here you can see I've clamped both pieces of wood together as well as clamped it to my table saw fence. The next thing that I need to consider is the kerf of the blade. Now I'm using an eighth inch kerf blade, so I'm gonna take an eighth inch setup block and I'm gonna take some double-sided tape and attach it to the inside board. This will make sure that we account for the kerf of the blade when we're making our cuts. Once we have all of our alignments made, we can then make our first cut referencing the longer board and then our second cut using the shorter board with the eighth inch setup block. So let's make those cuts. Once those cuts have been made, we can simply hog out the middle. Once we've hogged out the center, it's simply a matter of testing the dado fit. And as you can see from that, it's a perfect fit. So although this jig is just a little bit more complicated than the first two jigs we took a look at, you really can't beat the accuracy of it. If we look at this dado, that's a perfect fit. And this thing always produces a perfect fit. Plus, I still think it's a lot easier than switching out to a dado stack. Well, that covers our first three jigs. Now let's move on to a helpful little tip that I just learned. So one of the most inexpensive clamps you can buy is the pipe clamp. And as you can see, I've got a lot of them. 
Now the nice thing about pipe clamps is there's no limitation for how short they can be or how long they can be. Now pipe clamps typically come in two different diameters. There's the half inch pipe clamp as well as the three quarter inch pipe clamp. And if you've ever used pipe clamps, these things are powerful. They're probably the most powerful clamp you can buy. Because of their affordability, their strength, and their ability to make them as long as you want, these have been my go-to clamps for a number of years. There is one complaint I have about them though. Now, if you've ever used these clamps on glue-ups, I'm sure you've come back the next day and seen those dark lines where the clamps were. And that's what this next thing takes care of. So this is where PVC pipe comes into play. This is a great option to cover your pipes and prevent that black staining on your hardwoods. So let's go take this to the miter saw, cut it down, and I'll show you how it's used. So for this application, I like to purchase pipe that has an inch and a half diameter. Now this pipe is 120 inches long, so I've set a stop block at just under 30 inches so I can get four pipe covers out of this pipe. So let me cut it down. So in order to install this pipe, you simply take one end off your pipe clamp, and then you take your tubing and you slide it over the pipe. Once you've done that, you simply slide the pipe clamp back on and you're ready to go. So here you can see the two inch pipe will easily fit over half inch pipe or three quarter inch pipe. Now one thing to consider here is you could cut the pipe into smaller portions. Then you can easily add pipe or remove pipe and have that flexibility to use longer clamps or shorter clamps. So here you can see having this PVC piping over that black pipe will prevent any of that discoloration on your workpiece. So this is a simple and easy solution to prevent that black staining on your work pieces. If you're anything like me and you've had those black lines on your work pieces, you know that it's a total bear to get that off with sandpaper. So this is a great way to prevent all that work. Well, that covers four helpful woodworking tips so far. Before we move on to our fifth one, I ask you once again to do me a favor and hit that subscribe button and leave a like, as it really does help out this small woodworking channel. Our next two tips are miter saw tips. So let's go ahead over to the miter saw. So one of my first purchases as a beginning woodworker was this miter saw. And this DeWalt miter saw has done very well over the years. In fact, I still use it all the time. There is one aftermarket purchase that I made for this miter saw that I think is a valuable addition to any miter saw. The more you get into woodworking, you begin to realize how important accuracy and precision is. Now, when you're over at the miter saw, it can be very difficult to figure out where that cut's gonna be. Now, when trying to determine where your blade will land on your workpiece, a lot of people will take their blade and line it up with where you wanna make the cut. However, there's an easier way. One of the best purchases I ever made in early woodworking was purchasing an aftermarket laser guide. This works by the centrifugal force of the blade causing a laser to activate and shine on your workpiece. As you can hopefully see from this example, I'll initiate the saw and hopefully you can see this laser shine on this black line. This makes alignment very easy to do and allows you to creep up on your cut. Now these laser guides are quite inexpensive and are invaluable to your miter saw. Now a lot of new miter saws already come with these, but if you have a miter saw that doesn't have one, this is an invaluable addition to the miter saw. So I'll leave some links in the description below so you can go check out these for yourself. Well, that was a pretty simple tip for the miter saw. However, I do think it's a really important one. If you don't have a laser guide for your miter saw, go ahead and get one of these. Now let's move on to our second miter saw tip. So if you're just starting out woodworking, you may have a beginner's miter saw and it may not have a huge cut capacity. But did you know that there's a way to increase your miter saw's cut capacity? Let me show you exactly how to do it. So for this example, I've got a piece of plywood here at my miter saw, and this is way too wide for my miter saw to handle. However, I'm gonna make a cut on this piece of plywood and show you exactly how far it can cut. Now that I've made that cut, I'm gonna take a Sharpie and mark that line. Now that we've made that cut and struck a line where the extent of this miter saw can cut to, I'm now gonna place a couple of two by fours on the base of the miter saw to raise this up a bit. So now I've placed a couple of two by fours on top of my miter saw, so let's see if this extends the cut any. 
So if we take a closer look at our test piece, you can see that I've extended the range of the miter saw by approximately an inch. This was done by simply placing a couple of two by fours underneath the base of the workpiece to allow the cross cut to be just a little bit further. So if you have a cut at the miter saw that you just need to extend out about an inch or an inch and a half, this could be a potential solution for you to get that extra capacity out of your miter saw. Now one thing you want to be leery of when making this cut is you do want to make sure you have support to whatever's underneath your workpiece, as this will be cut through just as your workpiece is. So I hope everybody enjoyed those two little quick miter saw tips. Those are two items that I really wish I would have known earlier in my woodworking career. But that's enough about the miter saw. Let's head back to the table saw and talk about something that could protect smaller cuts that could potentially fall into your blade guard and get damaged by your saw blade. So this is a problem that I run into a lot when I'm making thin rips. When I use this thin rip jig, I'll run my cut through the table saw and my cutoff piece will fall into the table saw insert and get damaged by the blade. And that's what this next hack is all about. In order to prevent your thin rips to falling into your insert and being damaged by your blade, you need to create a zero clearance insert. And a lot of times you can purchase these aftermarket, but there's an easier solution. Let me show you how. So once again, it's blue tape that comes to the rescue. Now this is very easy to apply and it's probably the easiest zero clearance insert that you'll ever see. This process really couldn't be more simple. You simply take your double-sided tape and you place a couple of strips over your table saw blade insert. Once you've done that, you simply turn the table saw on and you raise the blade. And just like that, you have a zero clearance insert. Now, one thing about using this method is you do have to remove the riving knife. Now, if you're not comfortable removing the riving knife and making cuts without a riving knife, don't use this method whatsoever. But if you do want a quick and dirty way on how to make a zero clearance insert, this is an easy method to do with just some blue tape. Well, that covers seven woodworking tips so far. Only one more left to go. The last woodworking tip has everything to do with detail sanding. So sandpaper by definition is pretty flimsy. It's just paper. You can rip it in half just like that. And because of this, I've had a number of times when I'm doing some detail sand work and I'm getting in there with a thin strip of sandpaper and it just rips on me. And there's nothing more frustrating. But what if I were to tell you that there's a way to reinforce this sandpaper to make it two, three, even four times as strong. There's a really simple fix. And if you don't know about this, you need to know about it. You just need some duct tape. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This really couldn't be any more simple. You simply flip your sandpaper over, you take some duct tape, and you adhere the duct tape to the back of the sandpaper. Once that's nice and adhered, you then can take a razor and slice off whatever piece of sandpaper you need. With the duct tape on the back of the sandpaper, you now have a piece of sandpaper that's probably about four times as strong as what it was. This little tip allows you to get into tight little spots and maneuver your sandpaper around things like spindles and not have to worry about your sandpaper breaking on you. So for detailed sanding, you really can't beat this simple little trick. It extends the life of your sandpaper probably about two or three times. Plus it allows you to really get into those tight little spots without worrying about your sandpaper ripping on you. Well, I hope you enjoyed seeing these eight woodworking tips and tricks. Hopefully there were a couple out there that you hadn't seen before. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button and leave a like. Until next time, take care as always.